Nate, uh, as Hugh said, was a breakthrough figure in politics last year and in polling. And uh, he used statistical methods and analysis that we'll discuss here. And the reason that, I'm, that I have the privilege of interviewing him is that my book, The Numerati, talks about people like him storming into all these industries and using statistical analysis to sort of take charge. What were you doing last January when Obama was winning Iowa? From a data geek's perspective, you know, this was one of the best like kind of natural experiments you'll ever experience because you had an election taking place, the primary, Democratic primary, kind of in slow motion, right, where you have kind of one state vote at a time. And so much of the momentum, quote unquote, in the campaign was just about what order the states happen to be in. People, I think, sometimes you know, are fooled by randomness, <laughs> so to speak, where just arbitrary things like the order the states happen to vote in and you know, attribute momentum and whole kind of narratives that don't really exist in the campaign. Well, in a lot of the research that I do, people, especially in advertising, people say demographics is dead, that there are new ways to crunch through data and come up with behavioral tribes. And one of the, one of the ones that I looked at had to do with, with spotlight analysis. And what they did was they interviewed 4,000 4, people in great detail about their values and what they feared in life and what they wanted for their children, plus all the political stuff, plus all the demographic stuff, plus all the consumer stuff. And so they had massive amounts of data on 4,000 people. Right. And they tell the computer to divide them up into tribes based on their, on their perspective on life. And the computer did that. And then they, and then they go through, then they model those people and try to find which tribe 175 million of us are into, and they, and they come up with what they call new tribes. Is that something that you're gonna be dealing with? To me, it's not quite as robust as saying, we don't have 12 groups of voters, we have 175 million eligible American voters, and they're all kind of individuals, and some of them kind of cluster together in certain ways. I mean, the, the system I use for baseball, which we'll talk about in a minute, it's called Hakoda, and that is kind of similar, where it tries to look at 14 different attributes for every baseball player, since World War II, and you have you know, a certain player, say Lance Berkman, and you try and find every player whom he's like throughout history. Right. But it's not saying, oh, there are 12 typologies. It's saying there are an infinite number of typologies, and we have this very rich data set. We try and find people who are kind of most like him in kind of n-dimensional space. Right. It's not, you know, at some point, yes, if you're doing advertising, you're trying to think about what can we do that appeals to this particular demographic, it's helpful, but I think you can go too far in being too overly specific about things and kind of not seeing the forest for the trees. Most people who focus on politics care about politics and think issue by issue, and that most Americans don't like to think about politics issue by issue. Would you agree with that? Um, so people I think are looking at, you know, for quote unquote leadership and personality and so forth, but I think it's not as simple as people saying, oh, this guy looks good in a suit, I'm gonna vote for him. I think people really do think about their decision. They might not think about it the way that you might or that I might, but I mean, one thing I've wanted to do for a long time is do a project where you just have, go and talk to a thousand American voters, have like a you know, one hour interview. It wouldn't be a quantitative project, it'd be qualitative, where you're actually just kind of going through their thought process and treating them as being as serious as any kind of pundit on TV about what really motivated you to vote for Obama or McCain. And the people, especially that kind of go against type where, hey, you did have 4% of African Americans voting for John McCain. Not a lot, you know, but some. You had maybe, you know, 20% of conservative white evangelicals voting for Obama. I mean, talking to those people I think would be really fascinating, potentially. Pakoda, what, how does it, how does it relate to politics? Did you just, you start doing politics and you've got this huge baseball algorithm. Did right. Did you just yeah. plug it in or what'd you do? No, they're, they're pretty different, really. The good thing about baseball and politics, polling data in particular, they're kind of at this like level of complexity where you can, um, you can analyze them pretty comprehensively, right? They're not so complex where um, every kind of ounce of arbitrage has already been attempted or taken out of the system, but they're, and they're not so simple that there's not real work to be done there. And I think with baseball um, and in politics, I mean, they're both kind of long seasons. Baseball, you have a 162 game season, you're not going to find out that much information at once. Instead, the kind of puzzle comes together a little bit at a time. And I think a lot of what you're doing is you're really kind of conforming things to your intuition. It's always both like kind of an art form and a science. You know, with Dakota, when we're trying to improve a projection for a particular player, a lot of it's based on my intuition telling me something about this forecast 
doesn't look right. Let me examine the, the assumptions that kind of led to that forecast. The uh, economic crash that we're suffering right now, what effect does that have on us as, as, uh, as voters? I think under kind of ordinary circumstances, um, you have a recession, people are frustrated um, because they're losing jobs. Eventually that frustration gets directed usually at the people who are in power, whoever the incumbents are in kind of Congress and the White House obviously. You have people who are very pessimistic about the direction of the country. On the other hand, you have Obama who still has very high approval ratings, maybe 60, 65 percent of the population, and those two things don't usually go together. Usually right. people like the president, you know, if they're happy and don't like him if they're not, um, don't like the direction of the country. And at some point there's going to be an intersection and we'll see what happens. And the intersection will probably mean the midterm elections in, in 2010. One danger for Obama is that the last couple of recessions have been quote unquote jobless recoveries where employment tends to be a lagging indicator. So you could have, you know, GDP back in positive territory say by this fall, even by the summer, and it might take employment um, another six months to a year to, to catch up. And if that's the case, he'll still get a lot of blame from the electorate.